So it, um, I feel like Antarctica is the canary in the coal mine, to come back to an age-old expression. If that canary starts to shake and starts to look unwell, everyone needs to get their act together and get out of that mine and reassess very quickly. And we're seeing the early warning signs of what's happening up in the Arctic, the Himalayas, the Greenland, those big shifts are starting to change down in Antarctica. And we've really got to, as a species, be very aware of that. Hi everyone, welcome to Now Boarding, a new travel podcast by me, Payal Nair. Hi everyone, today I am in conversation with Barney Swan. Barney is absolutely a very, very interesting person and I'm so excited to be able to, to talk to him. Um, he's the co-founder of Climate Force, which was founded in 2017. And the objective of Climate Force is to contribute towards making sustainability more accessible. Barney has also, which I think is what I'm going to hear a lot more about from him, he skied uh, for 60 days, um, covered a thousand kilometers in the South Pole, purely on renewable energy. And this, in to me, um, I think, um, was done just to send a message across. So thank you so much for joining me today, Barney, on a Friday afternoon. Um, and you are in Queensland, as I understand. Yep, the top top right-hand side of Australia in far north Queensland, Australia, which is uh, a, um, yeah, it was cane farmers really uh, were the first people here after the, the timber loggers and now, um, you know, big conservation movements blooming in this region with us having one of the most biodiverse places on in in the world and indeed Australia on our doorstep between the, the wet tropics management area which is a world heritage zone with the world's oldest rainforest aim tree at the heart of that and then the Great Barrier Reef on the other side which is um, the world's largest coral system uh, visible from space. Okay, so Barney, um, just, just a very quick, um, you know, introduction to you in terms of your background um would be interesting wonderful well, i was born born in england in um in london and then uh raised up in yorkshire uh, until i was seven and then moved out to australia and uh did my uh, primary school and high school out in australia i went to boarding school in cairns which is my closest um city where the airport is uh which is two hours away from the farm that we manage and um yeah, so primary school, high school there, and then uh, was working for 10 years, um, primarily based out of California, doing a lot of consulting work that that South Pole expedition was coordinated and then casual pandemic global recession hits. And I abandoned ship from California, came back to Australia. And uh, in March 18th, I arrived in Australia. And only four days after that, it was all quarantine and you had to spend two weeks in the quarantine hotel. So I literally got in four days before all of that happened. Um, and then I've been based here uh, and really coming back home in in a sense of, you know, picking up a lot of skills globally with the World Economic Forum and what's happening with the UN and general momentum within the corporate and, you know, p private public sectors. Um, and then really coming back to a very rural uh, provincial area and really trying to, not trying, and walking the talk with a um, very tangible regeneration, conservation nature-based solution natural capital oriented project and um, yeah we're currently managing 372 acres which is 151 hectares um, and planted 6,100 trees uh, this last two months all geotagged and um, yeah really leveraging some of the remarkable technologies that are out there to uh, track and develop a lot of very um, you know transparent and irrefutable data because especially with planting trees I think a lot of people are skeptical and if you show them the data you show them the map you know it's uh, what, what can they say so um, yeah that's the kind of flow and uh, definitely my accent's a bit odd at this point I'm saying tomato tomato instead of tomato, <laughs> tomato and yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know what um, actually initiated this whole um, expedition you know of going to the south pole um and 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 doing something so so it must have been very very challenging so how how did it all come about and and what what was the sort of reasoning behind you wanting to do it 
Well, I think initially I have, uh, my, my father is a huge polar historian and a polar pioneer. He was the first person to ski to the North and South Poles back in the 80s uh, without radios, without any safety net. He pulled off some remarkable expeditions there and was actually the third team to ski to the South Pole after um, Scott and, uh, and Amundsen. And obviously Scott died. Um, and dad's expedition was called the footsteps of scott and he achieved that in the late 80s and then skied to the north pole and was in, imbued the title of being the first person stupid enough in his words um to ski to the north and south pole and i think building on his legacy um we really wanted to innovate and do something different um and bring <clears throat> a place that has uh left a huge imprint you know i've been to antarctica 10 times and i don't say that lightly you know it's a very emissions intensive place to go um but at the same time it's a very important place to discuss and to be aware of you know uh antarctica is twice the size of australia it's 40 million square kilometers 90 percent of the world's ice <clears throat> is in antarctica 70 percent of the world's fresh water is locked within that ice and if we melt all of that you know it's not a few meters it's hundreds of meters sea level will will change so it um i feel like antarctica is the canary in the coal mine to come back to an age-old expression if that canary starts to shake and starts to look unwell everyone needs to get their act together and get out of that mine and reassess very quickly and we're seeing the early warning signs of what's happening up in the arctic the himalayas the greenland those big shifts are starting to change down in antarctica and we've really got to as a species be very aware of that and I think the the incentive to do it on renewable energy and to innovate with biofuels and solar panels and ice melters designed by by NASA really came out of not wanting to be doom and gloom, um, but to be solutions oriented because we need to be aware of the threat, but we need to be more focused around the solution and indeed the opportunity behind that threat. So I think that that's where the Antarctic expedition came out of. Um, and it's just an interesting story. You know, I think the story is important um and you know going from the world's coldest place to the world's oldest rainforest you know it's a pretty it's a pretty wacky story really especially yeah. when i zoom out and have a chance like this to to you know share and to really think about what we're doing and so i think it is a globally relevant story and i love the word global citizens that you just used before because the more that we can think global but at local and i know that's a you know been use until the cats come home but it really is in such an important thing to have that global perspective but then to to bring it back to what we can do and i think a lot of people especially with these pesky things in our pocket and everyone scrolling and looking and waking up and turning on turning over in the morning and you know going straight into your phone if we don't manage this stuff effectively i think that it puts us into that that global sphere but without the the opportunity to do something locally um and i think that that south pole expedition definitely was a global feeling and now what we're doing in the rainforest is really you know what can we do locally you know how can we manage our waste better how can we you know inspire our employees and our students and our communities and our businesses around uh you know where we live and where we operate to really step up to to the opportunity of doing good for the planet um because it's not one industry's responsibility you know we all like clean air we all want food that doesn't make us sick we all want water that doesn't make us sick and without those provisions of our planet we're not going to operate as a species and i think um we're really wanting to tastefully create a model here in far north queensland australia that can help other tropical forests around the place because people aren't you know devastating the amazon and sumatra and borneo and indonesia just for fun you know you don't run a bulldozer through a forest just for fun you yeah. want to make money you want to make palm oil you want to run cattle you want to create maize to feed the cattle you want to create development all of these things so what are some of the projects that you know if you could highlight um that you are currently sort of involved in and um how could people who um are um, concerned about the planet and who care uh, can also reach out to you well, I mean, on the actual farm, we've got a lot of innovation around managing land organically. Uh, weeds literally grow this much a day. So you leave them for a month, you know, they're up to your waist. You leave them to two months, they're back over your head. So if we can manage it organically here, um, we can manage it anywhere around the world. And it has uh, applications for both horticulture 
forestry and basically anyone who's running lines because we're planting our trees in lines so we could manage them um but you know i think for people who around the world are tuning in you know i think that <clears throat> how we we have our impact pillars within climate force and i think those are relevant and they're basically broken up into integratable small scale actions that we can do restorative big scale actions that we can do and then connectable experiences that can really bring to life whether that's through volunteer work outward bound experiences sharing a hike with your family you know going to a farm seeing where your food comes from getting involved in a community garden I think especially that connected piece is really relevant to people because for the most part, most people know what we can do in a small scale, whether that's shifting our diet, sourcing re renewables better, you know, considering how we're traveling, you know, reducing our personal carbon footprint, uh, considering before you purchase, uh, getting secondhand clothes, secondhand furniture instead of buying new. I think people generally, you know, are fairly clued onto that. And then the bigger scale stuff, you know, of of going on a beach cleanup or uh, planting trees or investing in renewable energy or, you know, doing bigger scale restorative things that are giving back more than we take. I think that that's slightly less obvious. But to be honest, I think the gap right now is that connecting because so many people are disconnected right now. And I think that if we can encourage people to go and actually see stuff and get their hands in the soil and, you know, <clears throat> think if people go and and again i'm not preaching being a vegetarian or anything like that but if people go and see where their meat comes from i think we would have half the world being vegetarian so so essentially the 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 plants and um whatever animals that you may have uh, around you the solar panels and this whole renewable energy um uh, method it doesn't have any impact on them directly not directly but the bigger impact of where that those materials are shipped from like there's entire mountains in china that have been removed because of the cobalt and the different materials that make up solar panels so just because it's not affecting our farm doesn't mean it has that trickle on effect of where those materials came from but it's also psychologically really good because anyone who's worked it near a generator it's like boop, 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 yeah. boop, boop. you go a bit crazy after a while yeah. but you know the bird life and all of that it's definitely a lot more of a peaceful environment around there and also from an emissions standpoint because we're generating carbon credits and blue credits and different uh, ways to basically verify doing good from a conservation standpoint every liter of fuel that we use in our tractor or the, the the generator which obviously we're not using anymore but if we did continue to use that generator every liter of fuel that we put in the generator or the tractor over a year basically takes down from our carbon credit output because it would be silly if we didn't acknowledge the the emissions that we're creating while we're decarbonizing and creating carbon credits so if you're using a thousand liters of fuel a month for your tractor you know that thousand liters over 12 months would then have to have a, a ton uh, you know per ton association and then that would be taken away from your output of credits that would then hit the market and become tradable to help other organizations decarbonize if I uh, remember correctly from all my my research, um, no one else has. And, and you've kind of forgotten to add that it was the entire trip was um, only on renewable energy, correct? Yeah, and we still had biofuels. So it wasn't like, you know, I prefer my example before with the, the, the hydrogen not being... Um, sorry the the hydro like the dam it, it, you know yeah. biofuels are a transitional thing so it wasn't like we were you know just powered off the wind we still yeah. had biofuels but they were made not from virgin materials and we were innovating and worked with nasa to have a nasa designed solar <clears throat> solar ice melting system that had never been tried and definitely did things that had never been done before but i don't know i think a part of me feels that relevant struggle compared to doing that to what we're doing now we're planting hundreds of thousands of trees and 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 <clears throat> tangibly regenerating land it feels like they complement each other but i sometimes i don't know it's like what's next you know it's like yeah that was relevant in 2017 18 but now it feels like <laughs> yeah we're and doing in now it's relevant yeah yeah, yeah. so it's, it's always yeah it's that, that that's, current, that's current, 
yeah, that's a cycle of life and that's change and that's, you know, um, moving to the next uh, mission and, um, and, and seeing where that takes you. So it's all, it's, yeah, no, but I think what you're doing now is absolutely, um, you know, full credit to you and, um, and the fact that you've, um, you've got this, you've got a certain sense of um, purpose and, you know, and I, and I think you will definitely um, take this um, further and, you know, and, and I can see that I, I can hear the passion in your voice. So um, I'm really, really happy that we were able to have this conversation. I, I could talk to you for another couple of hours, but because it's so interesting to listen to all that. I mean, even for me, it's a learning. Um, and I was trying to pay attention to to not miss out on anything that you were saying, just so that you know, and and also trying to ask you relevant um, questions uh, because I don't know much about renewable energy, and so I've, you know, so it's a learning for me as well. And I'm sure it's it's your your message will definitely reach out to. Um, a lot of people across the world who will be listening in or, you know, eventually who will also watch um, this, this episode on YouTube. So thank you very, very much. Anything um, before we wrap up and, you know, anything that you, you just want to share yeah, I think, very quickly. I think, yeah. Well, I think we discuss renewable energy a lot. And I think um, that connecting with, our food is so important. You know, if you're lucky enough to have three meals a day, you're doing pretty well. But I think sometimes, especially if you're in a rush and I know what that feels like, I sometimes miss most days, miss breakfast because I'm so busy, but I think really both tuning into the gratitude of being, having a meal in front of you. Like I'm hungry, even talking about food right now, I'm about to go have some dinner, but whether that's sourcing locally or looking at the ingredients and if it has palm oil, don't buy it. Because that means that it's Indonesia disappearing to feed whatever yeah. you're eating right now. And I think little things like that, like I know a lot of conservationists and passionate people who eat stuff with palm oil in it. And you're like, if you actually think about that, that's really not good, you know. And I think with food, especially if we're in a rush and you're in an airport and you're traveling, you're like, oh, I'm hungry. You know, I'm just going to eat that because my senses want that. Being restrained, and conscious with how we eat, I think trickles into so many parts of ourselves with how we're traveling with how we're showing up within community with how we're treating ourselves you know the the the, the metaphor of um you know we are what we eat being used until you know it's yeah. boring now to to say that again and again but it is so true you know and i think i encourage anyone listening to really just explore a little bit more on where their food comes from and do a bit of research about agriculture and soil and runoff and the difference between doing things with synthetic chemicals versus doing it organically and the consequences of livestock and you know if you really want to have meat understand that you know beef is up here lamb is here pigs are here chickens are here and you know obviously there's the ethical chart over here which is a whole different discussion but actually from an impact emissions water scarcity all of these things especially every time you have beef it is hurting the planet there's no ifs or buts about it and if you go see the cow and you see him or her and you you know you acknowledge and you're part of killing that thing and gutting it and ripping its skin off and cooking it sure eat the meat but don't be ignorant to the fact that every time you have a like, yummy steak dinner, that was a love, beautiful being out there. And I'm not vegetarian, you know, I'm not vegan. I still eat fish. I still, I've got chickens outside. They lay eggs for me every, every day. So I'm not saying to go vegan by any means or go vegetarian, but just be conscious. Just be conscious in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think that, that no matter where you're listening to, what time of day it is, you're probably going to eat something in the next eight hours. Yeah. Granted, a lot of that might be in your fridge or someone's cooking for you. But I think connecting with our food and agriculture is so important because some people are really not tuned into that space at all and especially young people i think that you know taking them to farms and showing them and showing them how a seed goes to a tree goes to a thing that produces fruit and feeds us it's so important to connect with that life cycle because it's life you know and then the, the animal or the tree dies and it recycles and it goes back into that next system so i think if we can tune into 
the agriculture and the food process, it really trickles into so many parts of, of being a human. Um, and so I definitely just encourage that. And just to think before you consume, you know, do you really need this? Is there a secondhand option? Can I get it a local version of this? And instead of just quick buy, quick buy, quick buy, Amazon purchase, blah, 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 consume, 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 slow down, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't fire off a thousand emails a day. Yeah. yeah. But just slowing down how we especially eat and consume is so so important yeah it's convenience over awareness i think exactly. yeah that's the difference yeah yeah thank you so much barney um you have a wonderful dinner <laughs> which you said was waiting for you and i've really really enjoyed this conversation me too thank you very much and hope thank you have another you. chat soon yep absolutely you take care all the best thank you Hope you enjoyed this episode of Now Boarding, a travel podcast. Check out other episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. And of course, don't forget to share your thoughts with us. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes only on Now Boarding, a travel podcast.